All right. I like that. That's groovy, man. Groovy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what else is groovy, Ray? How long, when was it that Ian Adams, we discovered Ian Adams, you discovered him. Yeah, it was it, a while back. Uh, what what magazine was it? It was, um... I don't remember what publication it was, the but it was... National Review, I think. No, no, I don't think so. I think no. it was, like, I think it was, because I know it was Arizona-centered, so I think it had to be, like, the Phoenix... Okay. I, I thought it was Arizona Center because I think they published in the Arizona. I thought it was. Maybe I thought not. it was a national one because um, it was about self-driving cars yeah. and safety and how. So maybe it wasn't national. And how one. we wouldn't have enough uh, organs. But I don't organ think donors. it was a conservative was, publication. I think it was a yeah, more mainstream. No, I think you're right. And so it was like, yeah. So I got the wrong one probably. But it was so fun. I've and we've loved our street ever since. And they've been growing like crazy because they're doing great work. They have. And now on the phone we have one of their newest additions. Ooh, I know. Emily Mooney is with us, criminal justice policy research associate at R Street Institute, rstreet.org. Emily, very nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the, this opportunity to speak with y'all tonight. Oh my goodness, I don't know if anybody else has warned you, but we, you know, we like to have a lot of fun with these interviews. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, so we'll see what happens, but. Um, you and I forgot his name because he's because the name's not Arthur. Fr- Arthur, thank you. You guys no co- co-authored something in the Hill about criminal justice reform. See, my um, I had trouble connecting to the internet with my iPad when I got in, and so now my calendar's not working. Working where I put the <laughs> link to the story, but if I'm remembering, because I read it earlier today, so hopefully I can remember it right. <laughs> Louisiana, right? That's correct. Yay! Yeah. I got it right. Okay, so Louisiana is doing some criminal justice reforms uh, that are seem to be working, I would say, you would say, um, but there's also some criticism. So uh, what are they doing and, and how is it helping? Yeah, so last year in 2017, Louisiana passed a series of bills as part of a justice reinvestment initiative. Um, so Part of those bills included uh, different provisions for good time release, so um, allowing those who have exhibited good behavior and are moving towards um, becoming new people and having transformed lives, allowing them to be released earlier and saving taxpayers money, um, as well as a lot of other bills that help uh, remove barriers to reentry and increase um, availability for victims to get better services. Um, so really a comprehensive series of bills that want help Louisiana save some money and focus their resources on those who truly um, have the biggest impact on public safety. Yeah, not everyone's happy, though. Um, and, you know, uh, a state in the South, you probably have a lot of conservatives, maybe not all, but some. And, and you know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the 70s and the 80s, 80s especially, mm-hmm. I think, where it was like you could not win an election unless you were tough on crime. And, I mean, that's one way we got to where we are, right? But I think there are some holdovers still. And when you start talking about criminal justice reform, it's like, wait a minute. Wait, wait, no, wait. We don't want criminals to, A, get off easy because of justice. And we don't want them back on the streets because of public safety. And so this is being criticized by some. Yes. Yes, and the actual recent criticism um, was primarily noting the release of a 25-year-old who um, caused a crash during the New Orleans Mary God um, parade and injured some people. So because he's being released oh, oh, only two months earlier, but um, some of those people are we're using his face or his story as kind of a reason or rallying um, around the flag type of thing against these reforms. But our argument is that his release really, it's only a two-month change in his sentence. Most of the reason why he's being released is actually in how the judge ordered his different felony counts be served. Um, but that there are actually a lot of benefits for these reforms by, uh, make, and first of all, promoting um, people that ha- are making changes to make sure that they are returning to their communities and are better equipped to become different people. Um, and, and the reality is, Mike, that 95% of people that are incarcerated are going to be released at some point. So with that reality in mind, we want to make sure that when people are released, they are the best equipped to become and be different people, that they never return to the system. Um, so that does mean investing in rehabilitative programming, in um, encouraging those who are making those changes, those positive steps, um, in making sure that they never return to the system in the first place. 
Um, so that's, that's one thing that these reforms are trying to do. But also, it's acknowledging that just incarcerating people doesn't work. It doesn't work for public safety. Um, Louisiana used to be, um, formerly was the number one incarcerator in the world. It's now number two. Oklahoma has reclaimed that title. I believe Arizona is number four currently. Um, and states are simply running out of money to help these wow. people. Um, okay. It's a system in which you can't, um, the other priorities, um, health funding, education funding, pre-K through 12, um, you're funneling those dollars that could be used to invest in kids um, to simply incarcerate people in a system that isn't actually helping them live changed lives. Oh my goodness! Um, if my my last guest, Teacher of the Year, um, and she come, we come on and we talk about education stuff and tech stuff too, if we have time, things like that, because that's just a mutual mm-hmm. interest. And if she's driving home right now, listening, Robin, we've got the answer. <laughs> we criminal justice reform might be able to help pay for her education. I mean, that, the reality is that states like Louisiana and um, multiple states, Texas was looking at this a decade ago, um, with $5 billion of, in projected spending, if they didn't change their ways, if they didn't think of a different system, then lock them up. And the reality is that at the end of the day, you can't just release all people that are incarcerated to pay for, you know, your education spending. Um, so right now, Louisiana is the savings. They save $12.2 million. It's estimated over the last year as a result of these reforms that were passed in 2017. That is incredible. Um, and 70% of those dollars are going to be reinvested in the system to provide a greater alternative to incarceration, to make sure that we're investing in programming that's getting people the skills they need, that they can go back to work, that they can earn an income, become taxpayers again, um, support their children, um, that they're doing that. And then 30% is going back to that general fund. Um, to be reallocated to other areas in which states really need to make investments. Yeah, so, um, oh gosh, isn't the United States, you know this better than I do because you're, you're in this spe- in this space, but, but I've always heard that the United States incarcerates more people per capita than any other country in the industrial world, in the first world. First of all, is that true? And, it, and then second of all, that's appalling. Uh, that is that is true, though I guess the definition of industrialized world can vary greatly. Um, but we are the largest incarcerators per capita um, by those that are submitting measurements. So uh, Oklahoma then, therefore, as an entity, has that largest per capita incarceration rate. And part of this is due to just our history of sentencing. Um, and, you know, back when we were founded in the Declaration of Independence, uh, it was the citizens that composed juries and largely either found someone guilty or not guilty. And if you're found guilty, most of the time you're punishable by doubt, death. So if a certain offense wasn't um, warranting that sort of pe- penalty, then your local citizens wouldn't sentence you to that. Um, but as we had more a more sophisticated economy and system, you have the prof- professionalization, you have judges, you have lawyers. Um, and so, therefore, more power is starting to be awarded to almost these professional purveyors of, ju- of justice um, to decide on what would be appropriate punishment was. Um, and for a while, that seemed to work. But then um, lawyers would or prosecutors would try, you know, to encourage jurors that ha- didn't have much knowledge or experience so they could more easily convince of their case um, to join the ranks. And so you had more judicial discretion. Um, Congress started getting more involved, states started getting more involved, and then um, judges started giving out largely disparate sentences, depending on which state you were, what jurisdiction, um, and that was seen as unfair. And was honestly, it was unfair. Um, and so you had in the 1980s some of this, the formation of the Sentencing Commission and new sentencing guidelines, which later led to the institution of mandatory minimums or sentencing enhancements, and it created this rigid system Um, in which judicial discretion was no longer really truly allowed in practice. And prosecutors could use plea bargains or threat of mandatory minimums to induce people to plead a lower level sentences. Um, And and really, it it tied the hands of some judges where now, um, instead of allowing judges to make decisions based on the individual um, merits of the individual being accused, as well as the circumstances of their case, um, they're making decisions based on quantity, quantities of drugs or whether or not they've previously been convicted of something. In some cases, though, that knowledge can be helpful in determining um, what a judge needs to decide is appropriate for justice. But in a lot of cases, that can be really damaging and allowing them to really assess what the capability for rehabilitation is for that person. Wow. Um, and that, now states are 
facing this incarceration problem where they can't pay for to incarcerate all these people. They have people recidivating and returning to the system um, over 50% in most of the time. Um, so half the time we're failing. Um, we're failing at really helping people um, and challenging them to become better people. We're failing victims by not investing in those that have um, hurt them and making sure that they never do that to anyone else again. And so uh, it's sometimes that's hard to grapple that actually investing in the people that have committed crime helps um, victims and helps the community. Um, but that's what research shows. And, I mean, it's, you need someone to equip those individuals to look into their histories of mental health, trauma, substance abuse, help them work out those issues, um, give them the education and train them, give them opportunities to be um, to become employed and learn a skill set um, to really become a different individual, be- to become a productive member of society. Emily Mooney is our guest. She's Criminal Justice Policy Research Associate at R Street Institute, rstreet.org. Emily, got to take a break. Uh, when no we problem. when we come back, I want to uh, pick up where you left off there on some of the educational parts of this. And I also want to talk about, if we have time, who should be let go or who should not be put in jail in the first place and who should. That's all coming up as Mike Check with Mike Shaw continues. AM 1030 KBY, The Voice, Mike Check with Mike Shaw and Mike, that's right. With us still on the phone, Emily Mooney is Criminal Justice Policy Research Associate at R Street Institute. What is it? Free Markets, Real Solutions. Limited government, that's right. Right, on limited government. It's What it is, is, is it's mostly uh, millennials and it's all whip smart policy people who not only write great uh, white papers and stuff, but they actually get stuff done, too. And a big part of the conversation, you guys are have really become a big deal in the last year or two. So, And we just love you, and thanks again for always coming on. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right, so we're talking about criminal justice reform. That's your that's your jam. It has been for a long time, it looks like. Um, you were an intern for Prison Fellowship's public policy and advocacy team, so you had to have learned a whole bunch of stuff there. And then, of course, what you're doing now with R Street now. Um, so, and gosh, during the last segment, I think you did you did a solid three or four minutes just uh, of just <laughs> boom, 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 boom. This is this big history and where we are now and where we need to go. And so I want to pick up on that in our last uh, seven minutes here. Uh, the education part you talked about, where right now, People go to prison, they serve hard time, they figure out how to become better criminals. Uh, it's a terrible place to be. They get, they become hardened and they get out and they're, they're better at doing worse crimes. <laughs> so how do we fix that? Well, we like to say that's where we need to create a constructive culture within our prison system, in our jails. Um, so that part of that is the way that wardens and correctional officers interact with people. But a lot of that is the opportunities um, and to invest in those people and teach them how to live a different life. That's truly important. Um, so that might be a mental health or substance abuse um, treatment that's offered to individuals that exhibit um, problems in those areas. Um, that might be teaching, instructing fathers and mothers um, how to better communicate with their children and, um, and parenting classes that are based on evidence-based practices. Um, so there, that might be allowing individuals to uh, leave prison during the day to, um, or jail to serve in work release programs where they have a chance to practice a new skill set in the community or return to work. Um, employment is one of the key um, markers of whether or not someone is going to return to prison after their release. So there is an opportunity here for, if you know, according to you, um, incarceration, and, and some of the research in many cases can make someone worse off, um, that they're more likely to re- reoffend right. when they get right. compared to alternatives to incarceration, which in a lot of cases are better at identifying what is really going on in your life, what are some of the factors that are causing you to make these decisions or contributing to your decision. Um, and we want to hold people accountable, but we want to do it in the most effective way, um, both that we get you know, the lowest return to crime as well as at the lowest dollar point. 
um, and the lowest negative impact on families and communities and making sure that when people return, um, that they are truly a changed person and that they're able to really live a different life. Wow, that sounds wonderful. Um, I am imagining with the right effort, uh, that could be a success to a degree. There, there's always going to be gang member problems. There's always going to be some people that are just, you can't reach them and they really need to be out of society. Um, but um, I, I really applaud the effort. Now let's talk about uh, just um, before someone goes to jail, right? There, there's, mm-hmm. there seems to be a movement now, and we had this even when in some of our local races, like when we had uh, someone running for Pima County attorney, for example, and we had one of the candidates who was talking about basically sentencing reform on the on the prosecutor discretion level, where you know there are just certain things that we're going to de-emphasize. So we're not going to go after you if you're you know, maybe dealing small amounts of marijuana or whatever it is, you know, possession is going to be de- de-emphasized and, and these types of things. Is this a movement as well? And, and who should not go to jail maybe that currently is? Well, I think a lot of the focus currently for, so there's different aspects that you just brought up there. Yeah. There's before, who are yeah, and we only have three minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. So there's, there's part of that. Who are you pursuing charges for and what's the appropriate punishment? Um, there has been a lot of talk and a lot of implementation of diversion alternatives prior to arrest. So when a, you know, a police officer interacts with someone does that is, you know, maybe committing a criminal act or has, um, but also demonstrating severe mental health needs. Um, maybe the mental health system is the more appropriate way to deal with that person than, um, putting them in a jail in solitary confinement in a jail cell. That might instead accentuate those needs. Um, so you have some of those different alternatives that are really trying to focus on what is the best layer of accountability? Is that the public health system? Is that, a, you know, a short stay in jail? Is it a fine? Um, it doesn't mean that something should be reclassified as misdemeanors. Um, and, and as well as when possible, when can we use alternatives to incarceration for some of that treatment programming or community sanctions um, to keep people at home where they can keep their jobs and keep working? Um, that can save us money and also help people become more grounded in their community while still keeping them accountable. Um, so part of that might be based on the severity of the offense that's committed, um, the legacy of is someone a first time, is this the first time they've committed a criminal act, um, have you, are they a habitual um, or someone who's committed multiple offenses. Some of that might be used to determine on whether or not people should be um, go through a diversion program or, um, you know, face a trial before the system. But that, our goal is it to give prosecutors a long list of every single thing that we, you know, we think they should do. It's more to just start a conversation on what is the best method of holding these, of holding people accountable and what's most effective for producing change. And a lot of times that is not incarceration. Um, you're, as you mentioned, that's not all cases. Um, but a lot of times it's not. So that's, I don't know if I kind of answered your question there, but, um, there's yeah. not there's not a specific list of every single type of offense that I could give to you. <laughs> no, I think you uh, I think you answered it quite well, and I, I think I, I asked three questions. So yeah, you uh, you did <laughs> you did quite well with that, and you still left us with uh, almost a minute to spare. So that was pretty good. That was pretty awesome, actually. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so uh, what specifically are you doing uh, at R Street here in just in our last less than a minute, um, policy policy wise, to bring about these kinds of changes? Yeah, so our street's working on a lot of different things. Um, one of the areas that I'm working on is focused on that reentry part. Um, how are people, once they go through the system, how can we make sure that they don't return ever again and that they're living um, productive lives? So recently we've been looking at um, prison work release programs, how we could implement them in jails, and helping people gain steady employment. Um, another way is, again, um, looking at alternatives to incarceration. I did a recent uh, piece on parents and how... Um, child-focused programming can actually has been shown, and uh, Washington does a great job of this in promoting uh, reduced return to prison rates. Yes, Emily. Um, yes. Our time has expired. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so very much. This was awesome. And Thanks uh, for having me. yeah, we'll do it again. And you all go to rstreet.org to find out a lot more. Don't forget tomorrow, wake up at six, Buckmaster at noon. We'll see you at four. May God's love ever be with you. Buckmaster at noon. We'll see you at four. May God's love ever be with you. Master at noon, we'll see you at four. May God's love ever be with you.